everybody said. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Amen. Amen. We certainly on Memorial Day weekend want to just remember. I mean, that's this this weekend is a time also to remember this, the sacrifices that have all gone before us to allow us to even gather in this place, the freedoms that we have to be able to read the word of God. And the, so we don't want to take that for granted. We thank the Lord for that and also pray for those that um, the families have been left behind too of all these Soldiers who've given their lives for the for the sake of freedom. Um, I also want to thank um, you know the the worship team that um, you heard this morning. That's all our youth worship team, and um, we just uh, we're blessed. You know we're um, we're raising up the next generation of worship leaders, and so that's incredible um, to see. And if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of First Peter. And uh, we've been studying the disciples and, of course, learning so much from each and every one of them. We focused on Peter the last six, seven weeks. And last Sunday, we were looking at Peter the preacher. You know, when you get into the book of Acts, he starts preaching. There's four recorded sermons of Peter in the book of Acts. And we, we looked at Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3. Last week, and Peter used the same outline every week, and so it's bring people together, it's bring people to the scripture, it's bring people to Jesus, and then bring people to the point of action. And as you continue to go through uh, the book of Acts, you see Peter um, being used by the Lord to work miracles that affirm the message that he was speaking. He did that in Acts chapter 3. There was a crippled man at the gate beautiful that gathered there every, um, you know, when, when all the people would, would be coming in through the gate and he would be asking for money. And Peter looks him right in the eye and says, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he grabs him by the right hand and pulls him up. And immediately his, his ankles, his feet, his legs are restored. And this man starts leaping and praising God. And, and, and then Peter uses that as an opportunity to share the word, to point people back to the Lord. Um, we see that again in Acts chapter 9. He heals a man that had been paralyzed for the past eight years. 
His name was Aeneas. And Peter uh, says to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Uh, rise and, and make your bed. And immediately he gets up. And it's another miracle. Um, you see it in the raising of Tabitha from the dead in Acts chapter 9, where Peter just kneels down and prays. And, and then he says, Tabitha, arise. And immediately she, she opens her eyes. She sits up. And it's this miracle that you read about in the book of Acts. And so many miracles were happening that it says in Acts chapter 5 that Peter, uh, people, the crowd was just um, putting the sick uh, around Peter so that even his shadow could just cast over the sick and they would be healed. And God is doing all these miracles for one reason, to affirm the word that is being preached and to bring people to know the Lord. And so Peter becomes a leader. Um, he presides over the appointment of Matthias as the replacement for Judas Iscariot. Um, he deals with the issue of Ananias and Sapphira. He confronts uh, Simon the sorcerer. Um, he's the first one to reach out to the Gentiles. And so um, because of this, he becomes a prisoner. He's thrown into prison many times. Um, he Remember, he had proclaimed in Luke 22 to Jesus himself, I will go to prison for you and even death. Well, in the book of Acts, you start to see that happen. He's thrown into prison many times. Um, in Acts chapter 4, um, they throw him in prison and they command him, do not teach or preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And then they let him go. And what does he do the next day? He preaches and teaches in the name of Jesus. He's not going to stop. And, th and that's just, you see that throughout the book of Acts. Um, you know, when you get to Acts 12, James is murdered. And, um, and then they, they throw Peter into prison. But again, an angel of the Lord um, frees him, breaks the shackles, the chains, and, and frees him from prison. And he keeps proclaiming the word of God. He preaches to the Gentiles. Um, and Peter still had some struggles. You're going to see that even as you go through the book of Acts. Um, for Peter, it was, he had a hard time accepting the fact that all these other nations be, could be coming to know the Lord too. So he had this deep-rooted uh, racism inside of him. And so in Acts chapter 10, the Lord gives him this vision of this sheet descending, and in this sheet, in this blanket, is all of these unclean animals. And so you'd see like a, a vulture in there, you'd see dogs in there, a skunk in there, there were pigs in this. This was the original pigs in a blanket, I don't know if you knew that, that's where it, Acts chapter 10. And God says, Peter, rise and eat. And Peter says, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And, and, and God gives him this vision three times. I don't know what it is, but it always takes Peter three times to get something. And so he finally gets it. And, and he says later in that chapter 10, verse 28, God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So he's saying, now I understand that God doesn't show any partiality, um, but in every nation, in anyone who fears him, who believes in him, can receive forgiveness of sins through his name. And so that's, I think, God's calling right now. I hear him. <laughs> Is that something that you need help with? Uh, okay. Peter learns this in the same place that Jonah, you remember Jonah didn't want to go and preach to Nineveh. And so he runs to Joppa. This is the same exact place that Peter has his vision. You see, God has a plan. It's the same God that we worship. And Peter starts to get it. And so then he lives this out. He goes to Antioch. Yeah, he would minister in Corinth. He goes to Rome. And while he's in Rome, he writes two books that have become a part of the scripture um, that reached the world for Jesus. Um, there were only three of the 12 disciples 
who wrote books that were included in the canon of Scripture. One was John. Um, he wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. And then you got Matthew. He writes the Gospel of Matthew. And then you've got Peter, who writes 1st and 2nd Peter. This is written uh, towards the end of his life, around 64 A.D. And uh, Paul and Peter are both martyred around this time. Um, and one of the things that Peter teaches us in 1 Peter is about the idea of trials, suffering, difficulties, hurts, pains. It's something that, that Peter knew a great deal about. And in 1 Peter, you're going to get Peter's own words on how to deal with this. And maybe, maybe you've been going through a really difficult time in your life right now. Uh, you've lost a loved one or there's some kind of physical hurt or spiritual pain or relational strain in your life. And maybe God brought you here this morning just so you could read Peter's words on how to deal with those times of difficulty. Now, I'm, I'm going to show you 10 things from this book and we're going to have to move quickly to get through all of them. I want to start in 1 Peter 4 verse 12. Peter writes, <coughs> beloved, he starts there, beloved, in other words, I want you to remember who you are, you know, throughout this book, you see that, uh, Peter's reminding them, you're God's children, that's uh, chapter 1, verse 14, chapter 2, verse 9, he's saying, you're, you're, you're holy, you're elect, you're you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're, you're God's own possession. You're the flock of God. You see that all through the book. He keeps reminding them that he's the one that defines our identity, not the world. And so he starts by saying, beloved, and then he says, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you. This is the same thing he learned from Jesus in John 16. Because it was Jesus who said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Not might, not you, maybe it's going to happen. No, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And so Peter learned that, and so what's happening contextually as Peter's writing this? Nero, this is around 64 AD, there was a fire that happened in Rome. And Nero blames all the Christians. All the Christians must have done that. The Christians have set all these fires. And so there's this outbreak of persecution on the Christians. And, and the Roman historian Tacitus records that Christians were arrested, they were thrown in prison, they were condemned to death, they were clothed in these um, skins of wild animals to mock them, um, they were torn to pieces like by dogs, they were crucified on crosses, and they were even put on stakes, and then um, they would throw tar over them and light them on fire to ignite the streets of Rome. That's the context to which Peter is writing. They knew about hardship and pain. You see, trials affect everybody. Everybody. You know, Oswald Chambers in his book, Christian Deci uh, Discipline, said, suffering is the heritage, listen to this, suffering is the heritage of the bad, the penitent, and the Son of God. The bad thief was crucified, the penitent thief was crucified, and the Son of God was crucified. So there's this widespread heritage of suffering in this broken world. And Peter's saying, you know that's going to happen in this world. There's going to be trouble. And sometimes it's because of our own sin. Sometimes it's because of somebody else's sin. Sometimes it's because of what Satan's trying to do to destroy you. Sometimes it's just because you live in this fallen, uh, broken world. And he, so he said, don't be surprised when it comes. It, because if you know it's coming, then you can start to get ready for it. You can start to, you know, give your life to the Lord. You start to grow in your faith. You start to memorize the word of God so you can set it in your heart and, and be able to meditate it and speak it out as you're tempted. You know, you can get a community of believers 
around you that can start praying for you and supporting you. And, and you can start to look at every struggle that you're going through as a way in which God is growing you and maturing you. Don't be surprised when it comes. But also rejoice and grieve. That's what he says in 1 Peter 1.6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. It's both of those. There's going to be times of rejoicing and there's going to be times of grieving. You're going to have both while you're following the Lord. So Simone Wheel once said, um, there are only two things that pierce the human heart. One is beauty and one is affliction. Beauty, these things that you delight in. And affliction, these moments of despair and grief where you don't know what to do. <coughs> and Peter says, in this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. There's joy and there's pain. And by joy, I'm not talking about happiness. You know, we've talked about that before. Happiness is when you have good circumstances, good happenstances. It gives you this feeling of this, this feeling of emotion, of being happy. That's different than joy. Joy is, is much deeper than that. Happiness is because of your circumstances. Joy is in spite of my circumstances. I have joy. In spite of what's going on in my life, I know that my God still sits on the throne. It's, it's deeper than happiness. And I'm not saying you just act like everything's easy and act like everything's just great. There is real hurt in this world. The difference for the Christian is you know that God is the one who can actually bring that test that you're going through into a testimony. He, God is the one who can take that Good Friday moment, that, that cross that you have to bear, that, that darkest moment in your life, and actually bring it into a resurrection of life Easter Sunday. That's the difference. That's where your joy comes from. That's why it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Matthew 5.10, <coughs> blessed are those who've been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and, and, and persecute you and, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is, this is Christ saying there's going to be persecution. There's going to be insults. People are going to give false testimony against you. They will say evil about you. But there's also a blessing and a reward. So count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, it's the third point. Know that God is purifying you. That, that's 1 Peter 1.7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor to the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter's saying, it's like gold. And how do you purify gold? You, you put heat under it. And when, when you heat it up, what happens is all those impurities rise to the top that, and that dross is then just scraped off. And so you're, you're purifying it through that testing of fire. Charles Spurgeon had this plaque on his wall with Isaiah 48, 10 on it, and it said, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. I've chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. 
James put it this way, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So we're reading the Word of God today. Did you know most of the Psalms were written because of difficulties? Did you know most of the epistles, these letters in the New Testament, were written from prison? Billy Graham says, you know, the mountaintops are for, are for views and inspiration. But fruit is grown in the valleys. A Sunday school teacher asked, how does a seed become a plant? And a child said, it has to go through a lot of dirt first. <laughs> That's true. That's... Maybe you've heard that old uh, illustration about the emperor moth. This man found this moth, this cocoon. He found this cocoon, and he took it home, and he kept it, and he's waiting. And finally, he sees this, there's a small little opening appeared. But nothing happened. It looked like the moth was stuck and it just wouldn't move. And he kept waiting for it to emerge and it, and it didn't seem to move at all. So he thought, man, well, something's wrong. So he takes some scissors and he just cuts along the cocoon. To He thinks, well, I'm doing it a favor here. But then this moth emerges and it has this swollen body and these shriveled up small wings. And he expected, well, in a few hours, maybe the wings will, you know, spread out. But they didn't. Because instead of developing into this, this creature who could fly, you know, this moth now has to spend the rest of its life just the swollen body and these shriveled wings just dragging around on the ground. See, the, the constricting cocoon is God's way. That's how God did it. The struggle is necessary for it to pass through because it forces the fluid from the body into the wings. So you think that merciful snip of the cocoon is helpful, but in reality it's cruel. Paul put it this way in Romans 5, 3, not only this, we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and per perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I remember... Um, do you remember that Titan submersible last year that went down to the Titanic? And um, it was designed so that passengers could go look at the Titanic. But, you know, there's all this pressure, immense pressure. And the deeper you go into these ocean depths, as it descended, you know, the external pressure kept increasing. And that external pressure, pressure, when it becomes greater than the internal pressure, what happens to the structure? It just implodes. And I remember waking up one night, because I was following that on the news every day, and just thinking about that in terms of my life. You know, it, as these external pressures are coming at us, the pressures, whatever it is, you know, just think about your life. It could be stresses at work or family difficulties or, or health problems or spiritual battles or whatever those external pressures, it can be overwhelming in your life. Amen? I mean, if you can't say amen, say ouch. Like this is, can we be honest here? So Paul, you know, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we're hard pressed on every side but we're not crushed. Why? Why aren't we destroyed by these external pressures? Because the internal spiritual fortitude that we have 
through Christ is strengthening us through the power of his spirit in our inner being. And that's how God works. And, and when, when you start to get that, you, you move to the fourth point. This I'm just going to trust in God's sovereignty. Like I may not understand everything that's going on, but I'm going to trust in him. This is 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. This is the mighty hand of God. Just this picture of, you know, just like we study in the book of Exodus, you see that kind of language. It's a, it's a picture of God's authority, that he's over everything, that nothing takes him by surprise, that he's still sitting on the throne. You know, and that at the right time, the proper time, God will exalt you and that he's going to make everything beautiful in his time. Remember the words of Jesus. In me you may have peace in this world. You know, you may have peace, but in this world you have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. So I want you to think about what keeps you up in the middle of the night. Now, someone shout out first service, my wife's cold feet, and I want you to, okay, that may be true. I want you to go a little deeper than that. <laughs> what is it? What keeps you up in the middle of the night? Peter has something to say about that, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxieties on him. Because he cares for you. Cast your anxieties on God. Anxiety is a universal experience. Everyone has different worries about the future, health, relationship, finances, whatever it is. So what do you do with that? What do you do with those burdens? Are you just going to let them weigh you down and steal the joy in your life? Spurgeon said, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. Do you think Peter had anything to worry about in his life? <laughs> so Peter's saying, this is what I do. I'm going to tell you what I do. Cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. Do you think David in the scripture had anything to worry about in his life? This is what David says in Psalm 55, verse 22. He said, this is what I do. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Cast. You know, Nathan and I were talking about this, that word this week of just, it's not just, just like, a little toss before you. It's a, it's a casting out. Like a fisherman would cast a net or you would cast a line. It's an intentional. You're pushing it out. But in this case, through prayer, you're pushing it towards the Lord. And sometimes we don't realize that, you know, our prayers are being hindered by the way we're living. You know, Peter warns us in 1 Peter 3, 7, Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they're heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. He's saying, treat your wife in an understanding way, and if you don't, it's going to affect your prayers. He's saying, have some self-control. That's going to affect your prayers. 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded. Listen, for the sake of your prayers. So whatever that is, make prayer a priority because it's through prayer as you're reading through the Scripture. It's through prayer that God shut the mouths of the lions for Daniel in the lion's den. It's through prayer that, that Elijah, you know, called down fire from heaven to destroy the, the prophets of Baal. It, it's through prayer, it says in James 5, that Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain, and for three years and six months it didn't rain. And it, it says he was a man just like any of us. And you, you can pray about anything. 
You know, one man prayed, Lord, so far today, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped, haven't lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, or selfish. But in a few moments, I'm going to get out of bed. <laughs> and from then on, I'm going to need a lot of help. Pray. The way Jesus put it, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. Rest. Yeah. And then just be aware of the devil's schemes. I'll have to move quickly through these last four. Just 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So the devil's not some mythical figure. He's, he's a real entity with real intentions to harm you. It's like a prowling lion that's just waiting for the right moment to pounce. Did Peter know something about that? Yeah. You remember, it was Jesus that said to Peter in Luke 22, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. So he's saying, just be spiritually vigilant. Be aware of what the enemy is trying to do. Or as it says in Matthew 26, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So stand firm in your faith. You start putting on the armor of God. You're putting on the belt of truth, and you're, you're doing that through your actions, not just word you know, or talk, but in deed and truth. You're putting on the breastplate of righteousness to protect your heart, and, and, and you're hungering for righteousness, right? Hunger, bless are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You're starting to put on the shoes that are fit with the gospel of peace. So you start sharing the, the gospel with everyone around you. Use the shield of faith that you're trusting in God no matter what. That's this, this faith that you're using to block the attacks of the evil one. You're putting on the helmet of salvation to guard your mind, to guard your thoughts by thinking about the cross and what Jesus has done for you. You're using the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that's sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide asunder even the soul and the Spirit. And if you forget all that in those times of just you're in the middle of the battle. Just call on the name of Jesus. That's what it says in Ephesians 6, 18. Just praying at all times in the Spirit. And then all of a sudden, you, you just start blessing other people. Uh, go to 1 Peter 3, verse 8. I want you to see this. Peter tells you how to live. This is how, this is how you're to live in the midst of difficulty. Finally, all of you, have a unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. So this is how to live, the blueprint for how to live a Christian life according to Peter. Live in harmony. Let's have, a, have a unity of mind. Right? You're not going to agree with everyone on everything, but there can be unity in diversity. Like, I have views of the scripture that you may not have. I have views on sign gifts. I have views on the end times. I have views on the tribulation. I have the, the views on the millennial kingdom that you may not have. And that's okay. I mean, I always want to be gracious to people that are wrong. So it's just, you know, <laughs> that's just the way I try to live my life, okay? <laughs> you, live, you can live in harmony. You can be sympathetic. You can love deeply. You can be compassionate and humble to people around you. You can bless those, even the people that are trying to do evil to you. Do not repay evil for evil. So this is Peter talking. This is Peter, the one who 
cut off the Roman soldier Malchus, his ear, as he was coming to arrest Jesus and take him away. And Jesus picks up his ear and heals him right on the spot, the very man that was going to take him to go on trial and then be crucified. Peter saw all that. Even on the cross, you know, there's Jesus dying the most inhumane way to die ever invented by mankind. He's dying a death on the cross, and he looks down at these Roman soldiers, and he prays, Father, forgive them. You know what that tells me? I just want you to think about this. If you think you're too far gone, or if you think someone else is too far gone, if you think about the words of Jesus on the cross to these Roman soldiers, there is no one on earth, either now or in any other time, who's gone too far down this road for Jesus to intercede and cry out for them, Father, forgive them. Just let that sink in. I mean, and you start just sharing this hope you have with the, this hurting world, like you're going through it. And people look into your life and they say, how do you have hope right now with what you're going through. And it says in 1 Peter 3, 14, even if you should suffer, for righteousness' sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that's in you, but do it with gentleness and respect. So yes, be prepared to answer, People are going to be looking into your life and watching you. And they're going to say, how is it? How can you possibly have any hope right now? And at that moment, the Lord uses you to share the gospel with them in a way that you never could before. And then to do it with gentleness and respect, this is Peter talking. This is the guy who was famous for putting his foot in his mouth. And now he, he, he gets it. It's like, I don't have to be condescending. I don't have to be first. You know, I don't have to sound impressive. All I have to do is just share the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. And then when you do that, it changes your paradigm. You start to get an eternal perspective that you've never had before. First uh, Peter 5.10, after you've suffered for a little while, listen to this, <coughs> the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. James 1.12, blessed is a man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Matthew 5.10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you hear it? it, it there's this eternal perspective that you didn't have before. So like Martin Luther once said, suffering is intolerable if you're not sure of your salvation. Like, if you don't know that God loves you, that he's not giving up on you, that he's with you, if you're not sure about your eternal future, then suffering is intolerable. But if you know Christ, once you know that, once you know Christ is coming back, that eternity lies in the balance that the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he's going to repay each person according to what he's done. And it changes your perspective. My, my favorite illustration on this is, um, I think I first saw this from Francis Chan, the rope analogy. But if you picture your life as this, this rope, 
And it just, it keeps going forever and ever. But this, this part right here, this is your life on earth. And this is what we're so worried about. And we, we say, well, I, look what I'm going through right here. And if, if I could just get, if I could just save up to get right here, and then maybe I could retire, and maybe if I save up and have enough money, then right here, then I'll be happy. And God's saying, what about, what about this? Eternity. Millions and millions and millions of years from now. And we're so concerned about what is going on right in front of us that we miss, we miss what the scriptures point to. You know, there's this old phrase, well, oh, you're so heavenly minded, you're of no earthly good. I think that is so wrong. If we were more heavenly minded, we would be more earthly good because we have an eternal perspective now. It changes how you look at what you're going through. It changes the struggles that you're in. You, like you're not comfortable right now. You're, you're going through a trial. But I know this isn't it. That this isn't all there is. That there's so much more waiting for us in eternity. And the choices that you make now affect what your eternity looks like. And Peter, with that, with that kind of perspective, he writes 1 Peter 2.21, and I want you to listen to this. For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Now this is a hard verse, if you really meditate on it. To this you've been called, because Christ also suffered, suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Jesus put it this way, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Peter did that. He spends time in prison. Paul and Peter both spent time in the Mamertine prison in Rome. You can still visit it today. Paul and, and uh, Paul was beheaded, and Peter was crucified. And we know in John 21, Jesus foretold this. He said, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And this he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. So the Bible doesn't actually record his death. Um, church tradition tells us um, Eusebius records um, Clement's testimony that Peter was forced to watch his wife's crucifixion first. And then... When it was Peter's turn to die, he asked if he could be crucified upside down because he didn't consider himself worthy to die in the same manner that Jesus did. So Peter went from being a simple fisherman to one of the most influential people that ever lived. A disciple with real world struggles who made a proclamation of faith when he said, Jesus, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. There were times when he doubted. There were times when he struggled. At one point, he even denied knowing Christ, but God actually restored him, and he became a powerful preacher who led thousands and thousands to know the Lord, and he became the author of two of the most famous books in the world, First and Second Peter. And ultimately, he gave his life for the gospel by following Christ's example. He denied himself. He took up his cross. And he followed the Lord. Let's all bow our heads and pray.
Lord, thank you for these words this morning from Peter. Thank you, Lord, for never leaving us and never forsaking us. You don't leave us alone. In the midst of our trials, you give us one another. You give us your word. And we know we can cast our anxieties on you. 